All right, you gotta switch the camera now at the rolling. Yeah. Hey, Ann, why don't you introduce everybody to uh, the Conan Show? Uh, welcome to the Conan Show. Okay, now we're gonna flip over to me. Hey, there I am. Hey, everybody, that was uh, Ann Bloomfield. That was a former, she is a former co worker of mine from the Ashokan, uh, what is it called? Center? Yeah, just, Center. It's just the Ashokan yeah. Center. That's kind of lame. Yeah. Should be more involved in that. Should be like <laughs> nature school or something. Mm. But the, uh, it's the Outdoor Education Center over there by the Ashokan Reservoir. It's been around for many, many years, more years than I uh, remember than they've been telling me about. And um, it's on a delay. It's on a delay. See? Because that's the, that's the uh, incoming signal. That just uh, went away. All right. So does it, it's it's changing without you touching it? Uh, no, I just changed it, and uh, it's registering opposite. Green is for her, and it's now indicating red on me. All right. Well, we're not going to worry about it. We should be broadcasting, and we are WATV Woodstock Public Access. And uh, tonight uh, we have our um, show is uh, going to... Uh, Talk about birds, <laughs> and, uh, and from a very good friend of mine, Ann Bloomfield. And uh, so, Ann, what brought you to the Hudson Valley? Oh, I thought we were talking about birds. <laughs> well, we have to introduce you first. I'm from Albany County, so I'm a Hudson Valley gal. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so just so you know, that's your camera, mm -hmm. and we can talk to the people. Yeah. And. Um, like I was saying, you know, I, I, I remember uh, seeing you uh, rolling into uh, the uh, campus in your little car some three, four, five years ago now. And uh, I, I just sort of remember your, your shining face in the window as you went in and, and had your interview with Jared. Um, My three hour interview. Your three with hour Jared. interview. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And. Uh, and uh, you were hired on, and I, rem I, rem I remember Jared asking me what I thought, if, and I said, well, yeah. <laughs> and so you got my vote to be employed there. Um, but uh, in, in a larger scope, so you're from Albany, and you um, uh, went to what university? Uh, university of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually from Voorheesville. Voorheesville. Yeah, but most people don't know where that my is. My so. Uncle Richard had a oh. uh, home there for many years. Oh, wow, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> Unc Uncle Richard and Aunt Frances. Mm -hmm. mm. um, okay, so I was thinking, you know, I, 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 I torture my guests. I do this a lot where I, <laughs> I, I call them up at the very last minute with absolutely no plan in mind, and that's uh, part of what uh, public access is about. It's real, it's uncentered, <laughs> uncensored, and uh, uncentered. <laughs> that was good. Uh, uh. And uh, so um, Anne uh, has uh, beaten me uh, in a lot of discussions about birds many, many times. And so I can attest that, that uh, she knows her stuff. Um, anything, anything, so let's try a time of year. This time of year, what's good to see? Yeah, so I was gonna say, um, you may not have realized how appropriate the timing was to ask me to come on because uh, this is the time of the year where um, like birders are getting very excited because uh, spring migration is coming up soon. Okay. And so we're still mostly dealing with winter residents, but in just a few short weeks, um, there's going to be a flood of migrants coming in and. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of excitement, and I have a little calendar here that I'll get into. Oh, great. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, if you can imagine what an excited birder looks like. I don't know if you've ever seen an excited <laughs> birder. But I think they look like, like <laughs> kind of like this. Yeah, this is the time of the year where all the, you know, birders start coming out of the woodwork and uh, getting really excited, so. Um. What kind of birds are we, uh, you know, for, for those of us in Woodstock and surrounds, what kind of birds do, are, are we uh, looking for this time of year? 
Uh, yeah, so it's mostly, like I said, winter residents, so our birds that are here all year round. Um, you know, in my pile of props here somewhere I have, you know, so you're talking about your cardinals, American okay. robin. You, you hold that right still towards that camera and we're going to zoom right in on it. Mm -hmm. um, black cap chickadee, Carolina wren, tufted titmouse. You know, a lot of the birds you would expect to see at your bird feeder. Um, geese, waterfowl. Right, I mean, you there know, there we the go. Okay, so now the list goes on. I will say that um, you know, there's a couple species on this particular sheet I'm holding up that we do not have around here. Okay. Um, but all right. There's another one. You have your right. woodpecker. Well, I'm gonna try to use, is there another correct? So we got some birds there for everybody to look at. Mm -hmm. And um, where do we go from there? Yeah, so I was going to say that um, people tend to focus on their bird feeders, especially in the winter when we're spending a lot of time inside. But uh, there's so many birds that don't come to feeders. So um, if you actually go out in the winter and start looking around, you'll see all sorts of other things that just will never come to a feeder because they don't. Because they're wild. Well, no, because they don't eat what you're offering at your bird feeder, basically. So like, um, uh, like a Canada goose, for example, you're not going to see one of those at your, well, maybe you could, but you're probably not going to see one at your bird feeder. If yeah. you go to open water this time of the year, you can see mergansers. They eat fish mainly. You're definitely not going to see them at the feeder. So, all right, a merganser is, is a. Because she's on me now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a merganser is is a. Um, is that it's not a, a uh, is a fish eating duck. Yeah, they're a diving duck. So there's dabbling ducks and diving ducks, and I like to say that. Dabbling ducks are kind of the ducks that they stick their butt up in the air. I've seen that. Yeah, because they're eating things like aquatic vegetation that are closer to the surface. Okay. But a diving duck is, you know, typically predatory. So they're pursuing prey. They're pursuing fish or they're going under for mussels. So they dive all the way under. Okay. So now, I, I heard an interesting thing once, <laughs> and, and I'd, I'd like to know if... Um, if this is true or if you you know about this now I, my my i have a naturalist friend by the name of jim davis down at the bottom of the mountain mm. and uh, i reported to him one day that i thought i'm not entirely certain but i was pretty certain that i i saw a fry in my in my water supply way up on top of the hill mm. and um i thought that was kind of unusual because there was no real it didn't make sense to me how fish could even get up there mm. because it's a seasonal stream uh, the pool of water that I, I draw, draw from um, is, is big enough to sustain, uh, I've seen actually some really interesting things in there, um, uh, salamanders and things of that nature, but I, I was pretty certain I saw some, some fry, some baby fish, and I asked Jim about that, and I said, all right, Jim, you got, you know, you, you're an old guy, you, you, you know stuff. <laughs> how would, how would a, a fish get up here in this very seasonal brook that, that you know, you know, it would be very difficult for a fish to get all the way up to the top, you know, 2,500 feet. And he said, well, have you ever seen a duck in there? And I've seen ducks in, in, in and around the area, so mm. well, the answer is yes. Okay, yeah, not <laughs> in that pond <laughs> yeah. per se, but in the swamp above it a little mm. bit. And he goes, well, uh, fish eggs will stick to duck feathers, mm. and, they, and they can be transported by, by uh, waterfowl to other, other waters, other locations. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, I've heard similar stories repeated a lot. There's either the idea of, you know, the osprey flying over, um, which is a bird of prey that eats fish. You'll mm -hmm. see them often carrying a fish. Um, you know, the osprey flies over, it drops the fish, 
the fish goes in the water, or like you're saying, the eggs stick to the bird. The bir and there could be truth to all these things, but I have no, the you know, evidence. Right, that science. This is the case. So, so it makes sense, but so science, you know, like what your your schooling didn't like offer I've that up. I've never seen a publication where someone made an actual observation of like that occurring. So, so I would have to like <laughs> catch a duck and yeah. scrape eggs off its feathers or something. Yeah, yeah. Catch the duck, scrape the <laughs> eggs off the feathers, put it in the water, see if they hatch and get back to me. <laughs> Gosh, there's got to there's got to be at least a half a million dollar study there. <laughs> I mean, it's totally plausible, especially the idea of like, you know, a bird with a fish accidentally dropping it, maybe the fish ha I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things that maybe someone out in the world has a better answer than I do to that. Uh, well, I, was, I just figured I've I'd never, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just one of, those, um, one of those mysterious things. Uh, um, another <laughs> another uh, thought, um, what got you into birds? Mm, yes, I figured that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so... When I was a kid, I thought it was just normal to know like theater birds, because my dad taught us all the theater birds, and his name is Jay, so of course there's a bird joke in there. Okay. And uh, you know, I just grew up thinking like, oh, every kid knows the theater birds, and then you know, as I got older, I was like, oh wait, that's actually a thing that you you know can study. Not everyone just grows up knowing theater birds. So that was my first introduction whether I realized it or not okay and then um, you know I went through my teenage years where I didn't think anything of birds I was too busy you know trying to be cool or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I got to college and met Malcolm my partner Malcolm and we were both volunteering on this peregrine falcon monitoring um, project I think it was for Audubon in Rhode Island and uh, we went to the top of, I think it was the Fleet Bank building in Providence, and there's like a two-way mirror window. Uh -huh. And on the other side of the window, you see this peregrine falcon nest just sitting right there. And there's, um, I believe there were chicks in the nest, and it was just uh, this amazing experience. And I th was kind of hooked after that. And um, Malcolm's mom is a birder as well, and so we would go out with her, and then somehow, you know, I just made a career out of it, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. It just, it becomes a lifestyle. It's like a state of mind almost. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what exactly was the tipping point for me, but. <laughs> um, now, you've done, you've spent some hours uh, birding. Mm. You know, and observing. Some, yeah. And uh, no. <laughs> is, is there a um, is there a particularly exciting moment that you can uh, relate to us that that you <laughs> observed or caught on camera or something <sighs> a, a particular species, or is there like a lot of defeat going on out there when you go yeah. birding? Or? I mean, you know, birding's kind of like fishing. I also fly fish. It's like everyone has their fishing stories. You have, there's no way to pick like your favorite birding story. There's just so many, so many moments, but one that sticks out in my mind is um, All right. um, a number of years ago, quite a few years ago, I was uh, working out on the mud flats at Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge, and um, I had never seen a blue headed vireo before. It's called a life bird or a lifer when you see a, you know, a bird that you haven't seen before, add it to your list. And I'm like walking around the mud flats and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this blue-headed vireo comes up and it's like fluttering in front of me. And I think it even like hit my shoulder and landed right at my feet. Um, and I look down and I'm like, no. Oh. Oh look, a bird that I've never seen before. And you know, usually to add a bird to your list, you're like going out and you're looking, and it's like, here I was just walking around on the mud flats by myself. <laughs> and a bird that shouldn't even be out on the mud flats, it just like came up and literally landed at my feet. And you know, that never happened again, <laughs> obviously, but um 
Yeah, that was probably one of the more unusual uh, birds that I've added to my list experiences. It's like the bird literally just came to me and was dropped at my feet. <laughs> but so funny. it was it was observing you. No, I well so out on the mud flats along the coast, I'm sure it's just you know migrating. It's probably really tired, oh. exhausted. I'm, I don't know to this day why exactly. It just kind of like fluttered there and then was on the ground. But um, you know, I would imagine it was just like exhausted or maybe it like got turned around or... D did um, you care for it or something? Or? No, it was fine. It just seemed like kind of... I, I don't know what it was doing. It just um, ran out of speed. <laughs> just yeah, ran. just like... Oh, hi. Well, I, I, I have a, a bird story to relate and that, that is... Um, it was the curious, most curious thing, and, and um, it's related to the barred owl, actually. Is this the meat? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, we, could, we could get into that, but <laughs> there was a, um, a period of time when I was out uh, up on top of the mountain, uh, Mount Tobias, for a, a, lot of, a lot of hours, a lot of hours, you know, day in and day out, month yeah. after month, out, and then that turned into a few years. <laughs> And what I noticed is there was this little tribe of birds, but they were, I would say, between 50 and 70 of them. Mm. And they were all little perching birds, all about that big. Mm. And they uh, were all different species. I mean, I, I can name a couple of them. I saw black cap chick, black cap chickadee. Mm. I saw the um, uh, tufted titmouse. Um, and then there was one with a long, spiky beak. A long pointy beak. I don't know what that Am one I was. Am I supposed to guess just based on um, <laughs> like a woodpecker? Well, there was woodpeckers too, but they, they didn't they didn't fly around within this little group. Was it on the ground? It was like or? that one. Oh. Nuthatch? No. Yeah, I mean. It, yeah. Um, and then there was like um, a few of those guys, hmm. but there were some uh, uh, sparrows were in this in this group and things like that. But but it was just very interesting to me that they were all different species or types, and yet they were a gang. I mean, they, it got to the point there <laughs> where, where I was feeding them. I had a little feeding station out my window where mm. I could you know, photograph them and stuff, and uh, juncos would be on the ground, so juncos hung out with them too. Mm -hmm. And they, um, would, they started monitoring me in the woods. So I would go off and I'd, I'd be you know, cutting for firewood or whatever, and, and they, they would just sort of follow me and keep an eye on me. And on occasion, they would let me know if, if someone was coming up the road or whatever. They, yeah. would, they, would, they would get all excited <laughs> and stuff. Especially the chickadees. They'll yeah. let you know when, 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 when someone's coming. So when someone's <laughs> approaching. And I was just, I always, I wanted to ask you for quite some time, is that, nor, is that like a common thing to see? Or? Uh, yeah, you can see a, like a foraging flock. Um, so normally, Chickadees are sort of the leader of the gang. They're like really, they're the local resident, like they know where the food is. They're very vocal if there's a predator. Um, and like other birds will kind of like hook up into the same flock and they'll all kind of like move around in a mixed flock like you're describing, just like foraging. Okay, that's the word I was looking at, a mixed flock. I've never heard that before, yeah. but that describes exactly, exactly what I was seeing. And, and, and they gossip. It's really quite funny. They they get into these these little you know they get into these little dramas with each other. It's quite it's quite entertaining, um, but but they got so accustomed to my um, my feeding station in front of my window that if I wasn't up and at them uh, by you know sunrise with you know uh, uh, handouts, <laughs> they they would get quite vocal out my window. <laughs> You know, and they, and and I, I kind of got a kick out of that. That you know, they they yeah, knew they knew like, they knew to bother. To get <laughs> hey, get up, get up! <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I'm trying to think of something else here. Uh, yeah, so the barred owl story was, was was quite interesting because you got quite excited about that. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that on the drive over here. I was like, oh, that time and the pictures of it, like hanging yeah. on the side of your house. I wish I wish I had. Uh, uh, some photo stills of that. I only have them posted uh, on Facebook and in my computer. Mm. Um, so I'm going to print some photo stills out 
for next time I do a show on birds. And uh, <laughs> no, but the, but he was he was a, you know they're barred owls a predator and they they're known for eating fresh kill. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was enjoying the um, uh, suet that I had put out and the, and the uh, deer fat and stuff like that. Yeah. And. Um, what was curious is that the little songbirds were eating right around him, and you 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 you, you, were, you saw that right? You saw you were was yeah, that you or that somebody else? And some of my photographs it shows the mm. little songbirds hanging in close proximity <laughs> with a killer. And uh, yeah, any comment? Well, just uh, what really struck me about that whole thing was yeah, you think of them as like pursuing prey, and here's this barred owl just hanging off the side of your house, just having grand old time picking at this uh, material. And um, yeah, that's the kind of thing where, you know, if someone just called me up and told me that, I'd be like, oh, sure, sure, you have a barred owl eating something hanging off the side of your house. But then you're like, here, look at this photograph. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, so funny. Well, that 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 owl is um, really quite uh, interesting because I believe it was the same one that would greet my truck halfway up the mountain. It was always from the same tree on the right, and it and and when I got to a certain point on the road, it would fly across my windshield, land in another tree on the left, and look down and make eye contact with me <laughs> through the window of the of my truck. Mm. And and this became a ritual, and I kind of the birds are like that. They're a little ritualistic, I, w I would think, yeah. and uh, because it made it quite a habit of it. And it got to the point after a few years, because it was it took years for these relationships to build between myself and these birds. Mm. And I'm not a birder. I, I'm I'm appreciating them though because mm. I'm, I'm getting, I don't know. I would classify. I'm, I well, I think everyone's a birder. They just don't know it yet. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and it followed me up the mountain and I think that it was the same bird. I can't, I don't really know, but I, I, I just sort of got that feeling. And, um, and so there, 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 it has sort of became like a little family of animals up there. And now, now the, my neighbor that lives up there, T.P. Bob, a bit of an eccentric, uh, he's been, he has uh, 30 years up there on that mountain, and he's got a chronicle of oh, handwritten wow. notes of weather, sunspot, oh, wow. sunspots, <clears throat> and events with animals. Ooh! So he's been, he's been and, and so he's been he's he's kept a log that is probably a, a little bit of a, a treasure trove. Oh, definitely. Of information mm. on, and animal behaviors. Um, uh, specifically, he, ha he has a the, the the deer and the bears really do know him because mm. he walks. He doesn't drive up and down like I do because I am not retired and I have a job <laughs> and destroyed a few vehicles up there just <clears throat> going up and down that road. Um, but anyway, um, One, what makes me speak to that is we were uh, the, sort of the last couple seasons we were at the Ashokan Center. Um, we had, or somebody had set up a mannequin with its hand out to feed the birds, to try <laughs> to. Did, were, you, was you, were you in on that, or was uh, was I that after you were? Uh, I feel like I heard about it, but it wasn't me that set it up. Right. <laughs> It was pretty entertaining. Um, <laughs> the birds actually started using it, started going to the hand of the mannequin. On yeah. The, yeah, I saw that happen a couple of times. I, 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 you know, it didn't work when I sat there and did it. Um, but have you ever uh, gotten that close uh, or that familiar with little birds that they'll come and they'll? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, people love this idea of birds eating out of your hand, including myself. Uh -huh. um, you know, you're not really supposed to do that, but. You know, who hasn't thrown a cracker at a gull at the beach or in a parking lot? Oh, no, I throw rocks at the gulls at the beach because they're always raiding my... That's, that's I mean, they, they come after my food. I have to protect... We'll talk <laughs> off camera about... <laughs> I love gulls, but that's a conversation for another time. Well, um, I love them too, but when I'm hungry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, where was I going? Oh, right. Right, so... so, so um, 
There's a place in Cape Cod where people have been feeding the birds for so long, you just go there with food and they come down, they eat out of your hand. Ooh, great, like so much fun. But you can tell that, you know, probably nine times or 10 times out of 10, the bird prefers to not eat out of your hand. I mean, I hate to take the magic out of this for you, but well, they are coming to your hand because they see an opportunity for food. Like when they come to your hand, there's this, there's a very strong hesitation. They're, they're coming to your hand because they've grown accustomed to knowing that they can grab the food and leave, usually unscathed. Right. But given a choice, I'd be willing to bet almost every single time if you have a pile of food here and a hand here, they're not going to go to the hand. I mean, you know, yeah. they're... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, again, I hate to take the All right. magic out All right, so that's, that's, uh, that's bir birding <laughs> etiquette here, folks. Birding etiquette. Uh, all right. A little on a more serious note, I was, <laughs> I was involved um, with some Army Corps of Engineers hearings at, on the Cattaraugus River, um, which is part of the Cattaraugus, um, well, gorge, like a canyon, uh, in western New York, near uh, that it, it empties out into Lake Erie, uh, okay. south of Buffalo, about 25 miles. And what's really uh, important about this. Um, River and 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 the gorge there is that it is a breeding ground of the great blue heron, and part of my uh, reason for being at this this um, environmental impact hearing with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was they were going to um, they were looking for public response. It was a public hearing. Uh, regarding an ice dam. Now, the idea of the ice dam, now this gets into a, a, a mixed bag of, of politics, but, mm. it, but it was interesting. <laughs> it was a bird that uh, saved the day. Um, <laughs> the, the borderlands of the uh, Cattaraugus Indian Reservation or Seneca Nation um, sort of included the outflow, the floodplain. Mm. All right, now there's a few key words here, floodplain <laughs> and developers. And the developers were uh, encroaching, um, there's a couple things in play here, encroaching onto the reservation without permission, you know, so there was some uh, corruption with that. But they were wanting to build this ice dam upriver a couple of miles, not too many, you know, not too far upriver from the, from the outflow to, um, trap the ice from making ice dams and causing the seasonal flooding at the end, at, mm. in the spring so that the, the houses being built in a delta wouldn't be flooded because yeah. they wanted to build uber fancy high-end houses. Um, what ended up, uh, the discussion was, is uh, the impact of the river basin itself. What would happen? Do you, now, do you know about ice dams on rivers? What what the, what their these constructions do? Uh, I mean, they cause the water to back up. Is that where you're going with this? Well, no. They they they, they, they try. the The objective is to hold the ice from going down river at at a critical point. And mm -hmm. then the problem is, is then they they sort of create a little bit of a of a of a, of a pond or a lake. Mm. And 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 the two two issues that really shot it down was, uh, one was the impact on the great blue heron. Mm. And it turns out that in their breeding grounds, that they have very, very sensitive eggs and that uh, if it is too cold by just a few degrees into uh, their, their uh, the egg development, you know, I don't know what that's called, is that gestation? When a, uh, you mean when a, when a, when a bird is developing in the egg? Uh, yeah. Yeah? All right, so, so during that time, <laughs> they're very, very sensitive uh, to temperatures uh, change, uh, changes from, from a certain window, mm. all right? And the ice dam 
would keep ice on that part of the river mm. weeks, maybe even more than a month mm. into the uh, past the breeding time and, and, in, and into that time when the eggs are, are, are developing or the, the chicks are developing in the eggs. And so there was that. The other, the other uh, thing that I think really shot down the plan was when uh, I had the uh, brilliant idea of asking about what kind of silt would be developed uh, <laughs> behind the dam. And it turned out that a lot of yeah. silt would develop. <laughs> and, and I said, well, what provision for the reservation uh, since the reservation owns half the, the river there at that point, and the mm. other half is by, uh, this other town, and I, I don't know what the town, the other town was, I can't remember. Um, you know, so who's going to pay for the dredging <laughs> of the silt every year or every five years or whatever? Yeah. And it turns out there was no provision for that, so I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that the, the, the town and the reservation got ang more angry about having to pay for silt removal than protecting <laughs> the bird's eggs. <clears throat> but I did get it on the record, mm. so so that was that was sort of mm. one of, one of my little things. So uh, in your um, in your work, have you um, worked with anything of that nature, like with with uh, environment preservation, bird habitat, that kind of thing? Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, or? I mean, there's always going to be some sort of conflict between um, the needs of what humans want to do, what birds want to do. Um, I guess a good example that comes to mind is piping plovers. Um, you know, we're in interior New York, so we don't, it's not a big issue for us, but on a lot of our beaches, the piping plover nests on the ground and they're a protected species. Now, you know, what do people want to do at the beach? They want to run their dogs, kite board, um, driving on the beach. All these things are, and development, all could, these things are catastrophic for the pipe and plover. Yeah, could you describe um, the bird for me? So you, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a little shore bird, very, maybe like pretty small. Um, very beautiful bird. You know, at first looks nondescript because it blends in so well with the sand, but mm -hmm. if you really start looking at it, beautiful black bands and white, and anyway, you should. What kind of, what kind of beak? Uh, really small because they're they're gleaning things off of the surface. They don't have a, a big you know probing right. bill like a lot of the shorebirds have. Just this really small little oh little beak, and um, they just make a scrape in the sand. Like literally, they kind of scrape the sand and form it with their body. It's pretty funny to watch them do it. They're like they they yeah. <laughs> they nestle they nestle yeah. into the sand and they just drop their eggs right there you know and if your dog comes along or you're driving or any of these things that we do at the beach um yeah it's pretty easy to either uh, scare a plover so badly it won't come back to the nest or step on a nest or step on a chick or even your dog grabs an adult um so it's always a balance between you know talking to people and um, just education and trying to explain why we should care about pipe and plovers. There's a there's a slogan you often see on a bumper sticker. It's plovers taste like chicken, and it's like if you're and often the bumper sticker has tire tracks on it. Oh. There's this whole like anti plover movement because people feel the piping plover is taking away their rights to do what they want on the beach. Um, and there's so many examples of that. Um, you know, it's like, oh, why should I care about this bird? Like, what is this bird doing for me? I just want to drive on the beach, you know. So it's always a balancing act between what we want to do and, the, you know, the needs of, of birds, especially this bird, which has very little habitat left. You know, we've developed our beaches. Um, a lot of them are public beaches, and um, there's so little habitat left that often you'll go to these beaches, and there's these tiny areas roped off, and that's like the only dedicated area that these birds have <laughs> to breed. Um, wow. So, uh, and, yeah. And in, uh, in terms of numbers, are, are uh, all those birders out there that kind of monitor this stuff, is, uh, what are the numbers looking like for the, for the piping plover? 
Um, their populations are recovering because of education efforts and like I said, roping off these areas. Um, but you know, there was a time where the populations were even lower mm -hmm. than they are now and there's certainly still threats to the piping plover, but the, the outlook is probably, I would say, better than it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know. Um. <laughs> Let's stop talking about depressing things. Just kidding. No, that's a very positive thing because that, 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 that's a good one that, you know, the numbers are, are improving and, and, uh, and seeming like, seemingly even a little bit of effort helps. So, yeah, so not, you know, not, to, not to undermine yeah. what efforts are going on. Like it's not futile. It actually mm. is, oh, is so not futile. I mean, and if you look at the bald eagle, the prime example in New yeah. York State, we had almost none left in the state. And now, you know, everyone's like, oh, I saw a bald eagle here and there. And, you know, so if we all put our mind to it, we can do really, we can do really bad things. We can do really great things. It's kind of like up to, up yeah. to us how we want to spin it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I do uh, spend a lot of time in the woods, especially in my uh, 20s and 30s. And uh, somewhere, I would say in the late 1980s, I was in a, um, an abandoned town along the Housatonic River mm -hmm. between Falls Village and um, West Cornwall, Connecticut. And I'm trying to remember the name of the town. It's gone. It's somethingville. <laughs> but it's it's gone now because of the flood of 1955 took out their bridge mm. and their town died mm. it just withered and died and so there's a lot of foundation pits and there's you know it's all overgrown now some mm. you know many years later and i had been hiking there through there uh one uh, s late summer afternoon and i encountered uh the largest bird up close i've ever been to in a, in a tree on a branch and it was kind of a, a, a brown light brown color I couldn't see its face but its its wingspan was probably six feet mm. it was big it was an incredibly large bird and when it took off I could feel the wind from its wings because <laughs> I came up behind it so I, I just saw its profile almost it's almost like a person you know <laughs> sitting on a branch kind of low in the big you know big branch of these you know big trees and, um, and it, it just blasted its way through the, the brush and the branches and, and, and flew away. And, you know, I've always to this day kind of wondered, you know, I, I assumed it was a bird of prey. I didn't get to see its beak. You know, so it, I kind of sort of got a glimpse of it. And it kind of looked like a bird of prey, but only the angle was so severe. Um, what do you think, golden eagle? Uh, because I, I saw it well, was it was one solid color. I didn't really, mm -hmm. it's, no, I didn't really see mm. anything but kind of a light, kind of a this tawny brown. This is one brown. of my favorite games where I talk to people who are like, you know, either don't know birds at all, or they're getting into it, or they just have a story from a long time ago, and it's like, it's really fun. It's like based on as few details as humanly possible. possible. Could you identify yeah, this for me? Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I love that. I love when people, you know, call name me that up tune. And you got one note. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, okay. I saw this bird, and it was it was brown, and it was hopping around, and but I would say being on the river where you were, the one color that you're describing, the wingspan, everything would lead me to believe it was a uh, young bald eagle they don't have the white head as big as that i mean it was big it's not small it's bigger than you i mean uh, yeah the size difference between bald eagle and golden eagle if you just saw it in flight and flew away i mean there's a size difference but it's okay. i would say i would say young bald eagle we're talking about a historic story with not a lot of uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, I wish I wish I'd seen his face. Now I know that I know that there were golden eagles in the area, and um, yeah, it wouldn't be. And they're fishing birds, right? They're they're. Uh, they eat a lot of carrion. They'll also eat fish. They'll occasionally take waterfowl, but I guess they eat what um, they eat. <laughs> 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 yeah. They eat whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be my that would be my guess. Um, now I have a quiz for you. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> So um, I like to 
uh, play this little. I'm actually playing this game with my coworkers at work, and one of my coworkers today was like, "Oh, it's like the most exciting homework I've ever gotten." Um, and so the idea is that, like, I can show you a bird. I don't tell you what it is. Like, I don't, I don't tell you anything about it, and you can tell me what it is. Okay. What do you think? I think I'll probably fail a lot, but. <laughs> well, because this is something that anyone can do at home. Okay. Do you want to give it a whirl? Or sure. A okay. Sure. So, here's your here's your bird. I'll just show it to the. I don't. It's pretty small. You might not be able to. It's it's really. Uh, You'd be surprised. That camera. Gets, <laughs> it, it, it does. It gets right in there. <laughs> She's going to zoom right in there. Keep, just hold still. Yeah, it's on screen. It's on screen. <laughs> okay, so anyone can do this at home right now. Okay. And so there you go. All right, so for those of you, um, uh, if you want to call in, it's 679-7777, but I don't know how, how effective we will be at, at actually answering the phone. Um, because I only have one technician, uh, uh, Lauren here is uh, teching for the first time for the Conant show, and um, okay. Uh, well, let me run you through how this works. So all birding really is is using your observational skills. Okay. It's just a puzzle. It, you know, people often think I'm not a birder, or I'm bad at song, or I can't ID these little sparrows. It's too hard. But all you have to do is make some observations. Well, all and right. So I mean, I'm looking at uh, the type of the beak mm -hmm. and the shape of the bird. Well, you kind of know this game because we taught that bird. No, I never, I never. I never. We taught it. Yeah, <laughs> did we? Boy, I have Teflon for a memory. Um, but, yeah, so there's this little thing here. And it's, it's basically just a slip of paper that has questions on it. Like, okay. Um, you know. What's the shape and color of the bill? What's the leg color? What's the eye color? What, what's the range? And we'll get into that in a second. Um, all these different things. So you, you're not even having any knowledge about you know, birds necessarily per se. You're just looking at this and making an observation. So what observation do you make about this? Well, he, he's a little fatty. <laughs> you know, he's plump. Um, it appears to be a perching bird, or a very small bird, a songbird, a, mm -hmm. um, and um, I, don't, I don't know, I keep seeing the word vireo, but I, I don't believe that to be a vireo. Well, don't focus on what it might be, but just, what, like, what do you notice about um, its breast right there? It's got a black spot on it. It does have a black spot. What about its um, bill? Like, what color is it? Uh, without my glasses, it looks like it's a, a two-tone. It, it looks is. like it has a, it a, totally a, is. a black or a brown stripe on top and a yellow stripe on the bottom. You're absolutely and, uh, right. Well, I also look at the eye and, and, and the, color, the color patterning around the eye. So you have a white field. Uh, it's, it seems like you know, the brown stripe over the top or the reddish brown stripe. And then, oh, and, then the, and then from the bill through the eye to the back is another yep. stripe. Mm -hmm. So th that, those that would be definitely markers that one would identify the bird with. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tail has uh, got um, a black tip on the end of it, or a dark tip on the end of it, and it's got a white belly, uh, stripes underneath the wing, or, or is that part of the wing? That's underneath uh, that's the wing. That's like the flank. It's kind the of flank. Like a, mm -hmm. All right. The legs are? Spindly. What color? Uh, it's black. It looks Blackish black. Or dark. Dark. It's not yeah. pink or no, yellow. No, not pink or yellow, no. So you make these observations, you go to your book. Ah. Book. Book. I'm not endorsing any specific book, <laughs> but I highly recommend this book. Sibley's. Yeah, Field this guide. is a great book. It's line drawings instead of photographs. You know, there's two schools of thought on that. I feel like there's no better way than the line drawings. So. Again, not endorsing a specific book, but uh, I love this book. Okay, so that's um, line drawings. So I'm just going to, in the interest of time, it's a sparrow. So we're going to go to the sparrow section. At first glance, you're like, I'll never be able to tell what that is. You know, look at how similar all these little brown birds are. And actually, sparrows are called 
LBB's little brown birds or little. LBJ's little brown jobs. Okay. So, and people call them that because they're so hard to identify. They're like, oh, right. I saw an LBJ today and know what it was. Right. Um, it was a president. <laughs> So you're, you know, at first glance, you're like, this is impossible. Well, I don't know, maybe you don't think that. No, I don't think that. I, I, <laughs> well, some people do. They're like, I, this is too hard. I, I mean, I'm gravitating to this fellow here. Well, but what about the bill, but though? The, it doesn't the, have the two tone. No, no, but I, you also, I'm you know, I, I can't see without my glasses, and I think I, I forgot <laughs> well, them at the theater. That. So um, you're but, like, okay, it's, you know, it's not, I'm kind of skipping ahead in the interest of time here, but yeah, that's you're okay. going through, and you're like, oh, you know, it's not, none of these have the two tone bill that we saw, and that's key, that the yeah. two tone. None of these do, so you're just immediately skipping all of these. Right. Do you see anything here that... Um. No. What does this say? Does it say two-toned bill? It does. Okay, because I, I see fuzz, fuzz, fuzz. <laughs> well, it says bicolored bill, and it has exactly what you described, the black and the yellow. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. You know why? Because now that I'm a little closer to the book, <laughs> I see more color. I see more color because uh, uh, earlier I was seeing just, I didn't see the reds as, as like these are showing here. Yeah. And the little, bra okay, the little black spot on the breast. Yep. Yep. And uh, the dark, long and um, so well-defined legs. We, uh, All we right. check yeah. our range map. Blue means winter. We check just to make sure that's where they live. Because oh. if you look here, the gray means they're not here. And so it's an American tree sparrow. American tree yeah. sparrow. So that would be a, a pretty common sparrow. Uh, it's a winter winter sparrow a for winter. us in New York State. So. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah plenty of American tree sparrows out there. But anyway, point being is I didn't tell you what it was. Maybe you've never even seen this bird at yet through observation skills. Mm -hmm. um, you make the observations and you can figure it out. Well, I got to tell you. And I, that's I, a hard, that's not, yeah, that's not a cardinal. No. It's a little sparrow. Right, and there's a lot of variations in sparrows. Yeah, and you just identified it all by yourself. And you said you weren't a birder. Oh, no, How well, about that? <laughs> I, I didn't say I wasn't a bird, right? I said I wasn't smart. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, that's uh, the basic process. Well, well, I, I have to admit that <clears throat> I have up up at the cabin. I have a lot of um, a lot about three or four um, field guides to mm -hmm. birds, uh, and and uh, some of them are line drawings and and, and uh, watercolors, and some are have uh, photo photographs in them, and it's mesmerizing to look at. I mean, so I spent more time just sort of looking at those than actually going out in the field and trying to match them up and identify them. But I will, I will, I will see something out there and try to identify it mm. and with limited success. Well, there's a classic, um, I guess I'll say, mistake that people just starting out make. They're, they see a bird, and then they're like, all of a sudden, go to the book. And the second they look down, it's like the bird's flying away. And so when you're out in the field and you see a bird, the first thing you should ask yourself is like these questions. Right. Quickly. You see the bird and you're like, okay, eye color, leg color, like does it have the two-tone bill? Does it have the spot on, you know, you can't, if you just look at the overall shape or you go to your book right away, the bird's gonna be gone. And how are you gonna recall what it looked like? So whether you draw it or paint it or just write in a journal like the answers to all these questions you go to your book later right. you can go to the book whenever you want right. it's just honing the observation skills at the time that you see the bird that is yeah. so important so critical and often overlooked now now you you um participate with <clears throat> a um a st not, not necessarily a study per se i suppose it's a study but um, you know, it's like uh, tracking birds and, and uh, bird count. Oh, the Christmas bird count? The it's been a long time since we've had a conversation like this, so <laughs> yeah, it has. I'm 
I'm not sure exactly what what it is that, that you were thing? you were you were showing me a participatory thing that oh yeah it's this any like citizen bird watchers you <clears throat> yeah. know going out there and if you 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 can do a counter you make an identification yeah. a positive identification yeah. on a bird there's a a little um, uh, there's a uh, a place to report it to yeah there's so many <clears throat> cool. They're called citizen science. That's projects. it. Citizen We're science like projects. Any, there you any go, folks. Citizens can, you know, participate in this. And the um, this little handout that I held up before, um, I can hold it up again. Um, it says Project Feeder Watch. Well, it's cut off because you know I All right. don't. Project know how Feeder think. Watch. <laughs> but right. that was the she's, one. She's we coming used in on you again. She's coming in on you again. Just hold it still. There you go. At the Ashokan Center, when I set up, you know, we had the lean-to, and the kids were counting the birds. We are submitting data to Project Feeder Watch, and it's like a way for everyone to report what they're seeing, and then people can um, look at population trends or sightings or like all these different things based on that and that's just one that's just one yeah. there's like the christmas bird count there's nest watch and there's also um, a platform called ebird just the letter e and bird ebird mm -hmm. okay so that's something that sounds like you can just log it's, on and it's check boxes so or something? popular among birders and it's like competitive because it ranks people and how many birds they've seen and um you can log on, you can put pictures, um, species, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, so yeah, eBird is, I mean, I go on eBird, anyone can go on and you can type in whatever species you want and look at the map. You can sort it by date, which is so cool in migration because you're like, oh, is the American woodcock back yet? And you can type it into eBird and see them, like you can actually see the sightings coming up from the south on the map. There was um, a, not to uh, digress, but I think was it was it the uh, an American woodcock that I had photographed outside my window? Literally, you 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 got excited because they were they were um, they were like dancing yeah. in my yard, and, <laughs> yeah. you, and and you you know I I think I posted it on Facebook, and you got back to me and said, <laughs> hey, you know that's kind of that's kind of neat. Yeah. They're, they're not supposed to. That be. is a perfect segue into my phenology calendar that I have here because if you, you want to say that loud for the people there a phrenology oh, phrenology it's just um, a word to describe like the order in which um, things like bird migration or plants flowering happens over the course of the season now you remember this was snow was still on the ground snow was on the ground and it was a very kind of you thought it was a, a remarkable thing <laughs> that they were so close to my house or that visible to humans this kind of thing um so I have, so I have this like, you don't have to necessarily zoom in on this, but this calendar put out by the Farmscape Ecology Program is so cool. It has like historic um, observations that correspond to a date on this calendar. And, uh, and I write my own observations on this calendar. And so just, uh, I am getting to Woodcock. <laughs> okay. Um, so in February, there's not a whole lot. We're coming up on killdeer returning. But you'll see in March, on the 2nd, last year I had American woodcock. So oh. we are right, uh, like so close to the doorstep of American woodcock that some people already have them. Actually, a friend of mine was just saying um, she had a woodcock, woodcock displaying um, outside her house. And I've had them in the winter before it's snow on the ground starting to do their display. So it's it's on the early end for American woodcock, but you know, not out of the question. And as we get into March, their, their activity really picks up. And um, I would highly recommend if you have American woodcock at your house to you know, seek them out because it's one of the most just fascinating breeding displays, I think, of any bird that we have. Oh. In New York, yeah. Um, well, we have no sh shortage of turkey, and and they get they get pretty uh, gregarious. <laughs> and uh, I, I, there was this one one um, male turkey that was in full, you know, full colors and everything, and he was challenging his own reflection in a highly polished side <laughs> of a door, Aww. and my and my at the bottom of the hill at Jim and Betsy's house, 
and, and, and it, was, it was very funny that, that he was really, uh, you know, really challenging himself. And of course, the more he challenged himself, the more he got angry and, <laughs> and challenged himself. And then the girls all started going up the hill. And he's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I oh, forget you. I'm going. <laughs> and so he went, he went and uh, gave up on challenging himself to follow the, 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 the flock. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, birds are so, a lot of birds are quite, intelligent and very complex but then you see the males do things like that and you're just like what are like you know sometimes you'll see like, like some uh, people i know i was uh, you know i wasn't <laughs> gonna go there <laughs> but i've seen you know you see birds like crashing into um side mirrors on cars and stuff because they see the reflection and when we hit the breeding season they're so charged up on like their you know breeding behavior and hormones that they just see the reflection and they just go nuts. Yeah, you know, um, you, uh, very, very, very quickly because now we've killed an hour. Oh, that goes by <laughs> fast. That's when you know you have a good show. Um, <laughs> I've, I have two observations that that uh, really stand out uh, from from my life, and one was observing a Canadian goose crash land in a, in my pond in Connecticut at Mudge Pond, and 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 the way the way uh, the fella approached, uh, I guess he was kind of a young bird, I, I'm not sure, but you know, when they, when they land, they, they're, they're supposed to have their feet yeah, oriented. Sort of water ski. Sort of water ski a little yeah. bit. And, <laughs> and on this particular day, this particular goose uh, didn't have his feet up in landing position quite right. Yeah. And he hit with such force that he tumbled over the top of the water in this great, fantastic wipeout. Aww. And, and, and then, you know, he came to a stop with his, with his tail in the air, and very comical, and then his head came up around the side and looked around to see if anybody had seen it. <laughs> and uh, then he righted himself and, okay, and nobody saw me. And I'm like <laughs> thinking to myself, no, I saw you. you know, I saw that. And uh, so, so the indignation was visible. I mean, it was really quite funny. So there was, that was that one. And, uh, what, uh, and another uh, involving, again, uh, water birds is these two ducks. And this is down in Rockland County, and I was young. I, I was maybe 13 years old, and I was walking home from school. And these two ducks were, were hot-dogging it. Where they were flying through the, <coughs> the bramble in the trees. You know, they were really fine, flying fast, competitively, you know. And they were, they were goofing off. They were, mm. they, were being, they were being adolescents, you know, like driving cars for the first time kind of thing. And it was the Henry Kaufman campground sign, all right? So you had these two posts, and then you had Henry Kaufman campgrounds, and then, you know, so, th and there were spaces between the, so these birds got the bright idea of going between the spaces of the sign, right? <laughs> and, and one did, and the other one, <laughs> it sounded like a home run, a home run at the, at the ballpark, Aww. the poor little fella, and he just, he just wiped out in the side, and he, the other one uh, was pretty heartless about it. He just <laughs> kept going. So, uh, so those are those are two instances of of, of bird behavior that is uh, very I, I'm going to say human, very human like mm. in, in terms of like one you know kind of not remembering to lift his feet when you know when coming to a landing, and and the other two birds just sort of showing off and being mm. being rambunctious. So. Have you uh, observed similar kinds of, you know, I guess you call oh, that. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think often people, uh, they sort of look at wildlife as these like sterile robotic creatures that are just driven by like instinct and whatever. But especially if you start looking at the same species on a daily basis, um, you'll absolutely see differences like that. Like I've watched, you know, seabirds that uh, they bring in time after time will like bring in fish too big for their young to eat and you sit there watching the chick trying to cough down this huge fish and you're like what are you like <laughs> what you are know? you doing or like some some uh, ground nesting birds they'll let their chicks wander off and then um, if it's like a colony of birds you know another set of birds will start pecking it and be like get out of my you know, it's like some birds, I would say, are quote unquote better parents than others. I mean, like when you really start looking well, at. Well, some of them are just downright diabolical where they'll leave, they'll, they'll, is it the cuckoo? Will leave its, its eggs in another bird species' nest? Yeah, well, the classic is brown headed cowbird. 
they don't even make nests. They just, well, that's their behavior. They put their eggs in other birds' nests. But now, you talk about a lazy parrot. There you go. That's pretty good. Survival strategy. Yeah, Here, you, you take really, care of my kid. Yeah. <laughs> but if, yeah, if you really start looking at birds, there's all these differences from bird to bird, even on the species and how they forage or how they feed their young. I mean, they're not just sterile robotic creatures. I, you know, don't want to get too philosophical or whatever, but I, I mean, I think that within a species, different birds have different, what you could call personalities or strengths and weaknesses. You know, they're not just all the same sort of robotic things. No, oh, they got personalities, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so in our closing two minutes here, uh, any any uh, thoughts about um, how um, people new to birding could uh, get involved or uh, yeah um, yeah I would say you know don't be intimidated by the people you see that have all this gear a friend of mine actually um, Ethan Pierce coined a term bare naked birding Okay. which is not actually birding naked. It's, uh, you know, you don't need binoculars. You can go out and you can listen to song. You can see, of course, it's great to have binoculars, but you don't necessarily need binoculars. You don't need a big camera or the latest whatever. You can bird with... Just get out there and do it. Exactly, yeah. Just get out, do it, um, especially if you're... Um, Younger, female, person of color, birding is still very much an older white male's sport, <laughs> to okay. be honest. Okay. So All right. um, it's always great when you run into like, you know, younger birders or people outside of the, you know, the typical birder demographic. Now, are, 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 so. are you are you doing um, you know programs in schools or anything? Are you do, uh, do you hang a shingle for any of this kind of thing or? Um, you know, not. Not currently, okay. but I feel like whatever I happen to be doing, I always infuse birds into it. Um, so even if you know I'm not uh, having a formal program, like you know, if you and I meet up for lunch one day, I'll probably infuse birds into the conversation yeah. at some point. Yeah, sure. So sure. it's kind of like I said, it's kind of a, a state of a state of being. You don't go birding. Right. You shouldn't be going birding. You should just always be in that state of mind of bird. It doesn't matter if you're in a city. It doesn't matter if you're on your porch. Like you yeah. can bird anywhere. So anytime you have an opportunity to share some with someone or whatever, you know, just like you said, just get out and do it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, Ann Bloomfield, and uh, this is George Conant, and I like to thank everybody for tuning in and watching uh, the Conant Show, uh, WATV, and I don't know Lauren's last name, teching for me. And uh, keep watching, folks. And if you love uh, public access TV and you want to see our program bumped up in a little bit of better quality, you know, let the town know. Give the town a shout that, hey, you know. Put some love into the station here. We need some new components, that kind of thingy. All right, y'all have a good night.